God created man, Adam and Eve, in God's likeness and in God's image. Different order than we have here, but we've looked at likeness. We're looking right now at the image of God. We suggested in our last vi last video that there is something about our ability to shine. We'll come back to that before we're done today. But I want to look at a word that I think is going to tell us a little something. It's going to, I think, further suggest this idea of what the image of God was, or at least what it's related to, and uh, what our situation is today. <clears throat> I'm Pastor Tim Holsher, and we're trying to see what the Bible has to say about what is man. What what are we? What were we? What will we be? Uh, um, I'm not teaching evolution, uh, but rather the fact that what we are now, I don't think is exactly what God created Adam because there was a fall and that fall affected a lot of things with regard to man. We, most obvious as believers, we understand we have a sin nature. That's true of everybody in the world, although some people don't recognize the fact that they have this, this very twisted fallen nature, this perversion of what God initially created all due to the fall. But I believe there was something else that was lost or at the very least damaged, and that would be the image of God. Now, as I already said, just to review one more time, uh, I believe that God is, that there's a reference to this involving the, God's light. And so I want to go to Genesis chapter 2. And when God creates Adam and Eve, we have this this statement um, in verse 25, and it says, And the man, or Ha-Adam, and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. We have this word over here, Ha-Arum, uh, and uh, there's a little bit longer form of it here because it's talking about both of them, but that's describing who they are. We're going to go down to chapter 3, and in chapter 3 and verse 7, after Adam and Eve both eat of the fruit, it tells us in verse 7, and their eyes, both of them, were opened. So, now, what exactly that means when their eyes are opened? Well, I believe part of it is, is their eyes are opened in the sense that prior to the fall, they didn't have a twisted fallen nature, so their eyes didn't see things the way we might today. Um, we look at certain things because of the fallen nature, and our our mind, our eyes, using eyes, whether that's, I, I think metaphorically when it's referring to our eyes, that they're looking with their eyes now and they are seeing things that before they didn't really care or pay attention to. But now they have a twist, a bent on the way they look at things. And I think all of us know what that's like because all of us probably have that with respect to certain things. And we certainly know what it's like out there in the world where there are certain people that no matter what you bring up, no matter how innocent a topic, they take it and they twist it and they make it something that it's not about. And it's the way that they view the world in this fallen, twisted nature. So now their eyes are opened and they knew that they were naked. Now the the, the issue is here, and, and I and I do believe, in my opinion, again, Hebrew, Hebrew scholars, and I don't consider myself a Hebrew scholar. I read Hebrew, I study Hebrew, but I would not consider myself a scholar in this regard. But I do believe that this term here and the term that we have in at the end of chapter 2, well, there are different words, and we're going to point that out here in just a second, but I think then they both have a little different emphasis. They both mean naked, but with a different emphasis. I'm going to pull up here just so that you can see these. Again, I'm not encouraging you to become a Hebrew scholar, but we have, this is the word we have in at the end of Genesis 2. This is the word in Genesis 3, 7. And you can see, if you look here, that we really have largely the same same set of letters. For the most part, we have the, the Yod and the Wow are, are different. And they're in different places. They've exchanged position in this. They both mean naked, but they do, but they are two different words. And I believe that this second word, this first word, I don't think it has really, for the most part, a negative connotation. It has, when you look at some passages, it has something that is that is willing, that a person willingly participates in, such as 
I believe this is used of Saul when he comes and he, he takes his, his garments off. And probably means that he takes off his outer garments and he's in his, what we, they would call their that long undershirt that they wore under everything. But some people insist that it uses this term naked and he was fully naked. But however that is to be understood, it says that he was naked, but he's naked by his own will. He, he The spirit comes upon him and he falls down and he prophesies and he prophesies all night long. And it's something willing that he does. And so there's a number of passages where this term is used and it's referring to state that a child or a baby is born in, but it's also used of a state that a person be comes to be in uh, of their own will. Whereas this term is something that happens oftentimes against an individual's will or in a very twisted manner. I want to take a look at a few of these. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, in verse 47, because you did not serve. He's, God is talking about the curses, by the way, that are going to come on Israel yeah, for not obeying the law. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and a glad heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies, whom the Lord will send against you in hunger. You're going to serve them in hunger. You're going to be hungry. Thirst. You're not going to quench your thirst. And in nakedness. Nakedness, perhaps meaning literally naked, or a lot of people think this is this is naked in the sense that you're not going to be adequately clothed. You know, they're they're not going to care that you have are fully protected and everything like that. Uh, and in all lack, this term here then is looking at something that is being taken away, something that that you're lacking because it's gone. And all of these are used negatively. In Ezekiel chapter 18, if a man does not oppress anyone but restores to the debtor his pledge. So there's there's a contrast. Oppresses versus restoring a pledge to him. And you have this in the law where one of the things that he said is you weren't to oppress people by keeping their cloak as a pledge because that's what he wrapped himself up in at night. So you restore his pledge to him. Does not commit robbery. This particular robbery, this term gets all over here, has the idea of to... to to strip away, to take away, to, to, to seize from somebody else, but in rather gives bread to the hungry rather than taking it and covers the naked with clothing. And th this is a person that's naked because of, apparently because of destitution, in contrast to robbery. Robbery would take it. This person is naked, perhaps because of this, and a person covers them with clothing uh, as, he's, uh, as he's referring to them. In Ezekiel chapter 23 and verse 29, they will deal with you in hatred. They will take, they will take all your property and leave you naked and bare. And here we have again, two words. They're very similar. They don't translate both of them naked because, well, they're together. Perhaps a person might say they're going to leave you really naked, but the two are naked and bare. And again, in, in the... Hebrew, these words are, are close, close synonyms here. This one actually being uh, a little closer to the term that, that we are, that we're looking at here. And so these two words are looking at something very naked. And it says, and then, and then the, the nakedness, there's another form of this word, of your harlotries will be uncovered. Now, the idea here is that these people, because they sell themselves uh, into, har into harlotry as a prostitute, well, then they're obviously exposing themselves to others. But he says, this is going to happen contrary to your willingness. The, you're not going to be doing this because you feel like you have to do this. You're going to actually be going through this by, forced against you, is what he's getting at. And all of these, I was just trying to see if I had one more, because there I have several of them, different ones that we could go over, but it, it just it becomes after a point just kind of redundant that we're looking at the same idea. But the importance is, is that this term, when we're looking over here, um, that there are some that have suggested that this idea is not just strictly just that you're just naked, but that you've been stripped, that you have forcibly been made naked. You, you've you lost something. And it's going to come down in the context down here. And it happens, I think, because their eyes are open. Their eyes now see this nakedness that they have. They'd been naked before, 
but they're able to see this because, well, because something's missing that's caused their eyes to recognize this. And I believe, it goes back here to Psalm 8, it says, What is man that you take thought of him, the son of man that you care for him, and yet you have made him a little lower than the, than the gods, referring to the, the angels, and you crown him, or surround him, at least surround his head, with glory and with majesty. And this is what God does with himself. Psalm 104, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed. Now, this word, lavash, has uh, the idea of to put on usually really nice clothing, but to clothe oneself over with splendor and majesty. And then covering. Now, this word here is a word that um, uh, is close to it's not exactly the same word, but it, it, it is close to, although I notice when I look at, at all my Hebrew lexicons, none of them see any connection between this and the word um, crown that we have over here. This is atar, and this is ata, or ota in this case. And there's a difference between the last letter, and I realize that last letter can make a big difference, but I still, in my, my mind, I just sometimes wonder is there any root connection somewhere back in its history? Again, I don't know that. I, I did some legwork and I can't find that. But whether it is or not, like that word over there that had the idea of surround, here we have the word covering. Covering, and that word means to wrap around. The cover by wrapping around is the idea of this Hebrew word, yourself with light as with a cloak. So God wears light, he clothes himself with splendor and majesty, but he covers himself with light. In fact, if we go over to 1 Timothy chapter 6, which we referenced in the last video, let me make this just a hair bigger, verse 16, 1 Timothy 6, who alone possesses immortality, and I believe this is a reference to God the Son at the present time, because he's the one that has died and now is risen and is, is immortal in that sense, and dwells in unapproachable light whom no man can see, has seen, or can see. In other words, they, they can't see him in this state of light. To him is honor and eternal dominion. Some, some think that this is God the Son or God the Father. The immortality makes me think that this is a reference to God the Son. Uh, and there's some other reasons in the context. But the point is, whether this is the Father or the Son, they dwell in unapproachable light. When Paul met the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus, he met light. He met him and he was in light that was brighter than the noonday sun. And I think that those are important things for us to understand, that God wraps himself in light. He created man also to be a being that can bear some sort of, of light, that can reflect something about God's character. And we, as we saw the other day, we even have the potential to be doing that to a limited degree now, not literally shining light out of us, but shining or reflecting his glory in terms of his character, his opinion, his reputation, in terms of how we live. We saw that in 2 Corinthians 3. All of this to say that I believe when we go back here to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, and it says that they were in his image, that there's some way in which we reflected or showed this glory of God, be that literal physical light or some other aspect of that. I think the literal physical light, I don't have a problem with it. We're going to have it in the future. He's promised it not only to us, but he's promised it to people that, from the Old Testament that he's going to resurrect. And if, and if he's going to do that with us in the future, I don't have a problem with the fact that maybe that was true of Adam and Eve way back there in the garden, that they had that image. And yes, they were naked, but if you looked at somebody and they weren't clothed, but they were shining, they were shining in some way, it would make their, it would make that nudity less stark. Whereas once they eat of the fruit in Genesis, uh, we should come over here to Genesis 2, once they eat of the fruit, now stripped of that light, there is a starkness to that nakedness. And they see that and they're ashamed because, well, this isn't, in some way or another, this isn't right. They see something wrong or off in this because I believe they're no longer bearing God's image in the same way that they did in Genesis chapter 1.
So I hope that that helps. Um, it's one of those things that I, I, I hear people say that we are in the image of God today. I think we are in God's likeness, even though that that's twisted. But I'm not certain that biblically we can say that we're really bearing the image of God in the same way that Adam did. I think that there's something the matter with that image of God in us today, that it is either gone or lost. Unsaved men, I don't think, are going around really saying anything great about God uh, in terms of their the image of God that we had in, in Genesis chapter 1. I realize that I, I might draw some ridicule from this because I because this is a very big deal, talking about the dignity of man. Uh, but I think it's important for us to realize that the scriptures say right now we're bearing the image of the dusty, but we're going to bear the image of the heavenly. That says maybe our image today isn't what it was in Genesis 1. And I think that those things are helpful for thinking about this present existence and looking forward to something that is, well, we all admit this, better than this, but something that may even in some way be better even than what Adam initially had. Those are just some thoughts on this today. Hopefully, maybe that helps a little bit. We've got a couple things I want to look at yet as we come as we come back to look at the nature of the body and uh, how we are going to... Um, use this body even in the present time. We've already alluded to some of that under the, the idea that we can reflect the image of God, but I think there's a few other things that remain for us to see before we conclude uh, this. Uh, it actually turned out to be a little bit longer study on the nature of man, but hopefully a helpful one. And with all of that, I encourage you to set your mind on who you are in Christ. That is, have a good day in the Lord. And as always, I really do thank you for joining me today.